coming. It's very nice to see you. you are, they are colleagues, they are friends, they are students. A very warm hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you for this wonderful event, the seminar of Tumitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences. We organize this seminar series relying on the unifying feature of science for humanity with the participation of distinguished speakers of the world. Today we have a very special speaker, a world-class expert in the field, as well as a wonderful person, Professor Anton Kapustin from California Institute of Technology. He is going to give a great talk on topological phases of matter and patterns of quantum entanglement. Anton Kapustin is a Russian-American theoretical physics physicist and the early Anthony professor of theoretical physics at California Institute of Technology. His research interests lie in quantum field theory and string theory and their application to particle physics and condensed matter theory. Anton Kapustin is a son of famous Russian pianist Nikolai Kapustin. Anton Kapustin obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Moscow State University in 1993. He received his PhD in physics at the California Institute of Technology in 1997 under the super supervision of John Peskin, the famous scientist in quantum information. Anton Kapustin has made several groundbreaking contributions to dualities and other aspects of quantum field theories in particular topological field theories and supersymmetric gauge theories. With Edward Witten, he discovered deep connection between the S-duality of supersymmetric gauge theories and the geometric Langlands correspondence. In recent years, he has focused on mathematical structure and classification schemes of topological field theories and symmetry protected topological phases. With this, I want to thank Professor Anton Kapustin once again for joining us and invite him to the stage to begin his talk. Please. Thank you. Ali Kram for this very nice introduction. I'm happy to give a talk here for a time. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to uh, give a talk on this topic, which is kind of rather general, and uh, uh, I'm not going to go into any technical details because if you do, like, well, they're quite can be quite complicated. Uh, I'd rather want to present some um, sort of bird's eye view of uh, relation between uh, condensed matter physics and quantum entanglement. So um, I'll start with something very easy, something we all learn in elementary school, so, or maybe uh, maybe you learn something more advanced. But I learned that there are three uh, phases of matter: uh, solids, liquid, and gas. So that's how we distinguish them. Well, I guess, uh, well maybe also about plasma, but uh, that's what we learn in school. Now, um, so there are three phases, and one can change uh, one phase to another by adjusting temperature or pressure. So that's a familiar picture. And there are many different ways to, um, uh, to, to explain how what happens to, say, some substance to change uh, the parameters. The one traditional one, maybe not the best one, but which what you typically find in like, uh, textbooks is to draw what happens as a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, so so in, in, from this point of view, you have some regions in this plane. Here's a case of water, which um, um, separates um, uh, well the internal lines, which separate different phases. Um, uh, so this ice, well, solid phase, there's liquid phase, and then there is a gaseous phase. Um, so uh, as you go from uh, one a region of this diagram to another, well, if you, inside this region, various quantities like specific heat or entropy 
per unit volume, they all uh, depend continuously or analytically on parameters, but as you cross uh, <coughs> lines, uh, there's a jump in all these various physical quantities. Um, now, um, sometimes the entropy does not jump, uh, but other quantities still have some sort of singularities. For example, if you look at some another yeah, famous example, uh, uh, helium, uh, transition of helium from a normal phase or high temperature to a superfluid phase. Well, in that case, there's no entropy jump, but uh, there is some sort of singularity of, uh, say, specific heat out of it. So this is uh, the shape of this uh, curve. For example, the Greek letter lambda, so it's called known as the lambda transition. So these kind of transitions are called continuous or second order. Um, so um, actually, this distinction was uh, emphasized by uh, Landau. Landau is only as early as 1937. And he also emphasizes that most phase transitions are associated with a uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry break. And what does it mean? Well, it's a very uh, uh, important concept in physics. Uh, the idea is that, well, if you have some symmetry, microscopic like symmetry of the system, there are still different ways this symmetry can be realized. So, and as one crosses uh, lines in this uh, phase diagram, the way it's materialized can change. And the most famous uh, example is a, is a say, mm. transition from a liquid to a crystal. Uh, you can see from a crystal, for example, has a, clearly has special directions in space. So a crystal has a less rotational symmetry uh, than a liquid. Well, actually, it has also less translational symmetry, but that's not very obvious. If you stare at it, you need to use uh, some x-rays to see that there is some uh, loss of translational symmetry as you go from liquid to crystal. So, and, and this happens despite the fact that, uh, you know, as far as uh, the energy function of Hamiltonian is concerned, it has still complete uh, symmetry under rotational translations. So, but, but the point is simply that when you look at the, uh, well, that stable equilibrium state, the crystal, it does not have, uh, well, that does not have full rotational symmetry. That's called spontaneous symmetry. So this loss of symmetry, again, to reiterate, will not cause external factors. So the energy function is still invariant under all rotation translations, but stable equilibrium states are not. Uh, and the way the symmetry is broken is uh, coherent across uh, microscopic distances. So people often, often say that this is a uh, uh, the broken symmetry means there is long range order. So, in some phases in this diagram, in phase diagram can have uh, long range order or equivalently have broken symmetry, and some only have short range order uh, and, or equivalently there is no symmetry breaking. And here's a, everybody's uh, favorite example of this phenomenon uh, the two dimensional Ising model. So, uh, so here, it's essentially a classical model. So uh, you have classical spins, uh, which are uh, take values uh, one or minus one. Uh, and each spin is located on, on a square, well, on a side of a square lattice. Well, that can be, doesn't have to be square. It can be like some higher dimensional lattice, but the most famous case of the square is the two-dimensional. And the energy function, well, this is the simplest version of it, uh, where you know, spins <coughs> on different sides interact by this pairwise. So, so if uh, say, well, well, so here uh, this A B is the edge connecting point in. So this energy function, well, you we could also ter add terms with magnetic magnetic fields, but in this case there's no. Well, I decided not to do it. So this energy function is invariant under a symmetry, which flips the sign of all this variable signal. Um, so we have to flip them all simultaneously, otherwise you know it will be the energy. Will change. Now, um, in this particular case, there's a, we know exactly what, where the phase transition happens. Well, there are two parameters here. Uh, one is obvious here, it's this, uh, the strength of the coupling, called J, and the other one is temperature, but really only the ratio of the two matters. So if you have, um, J is large compared to the uh, critical value of the temperature. Well, if J is large compared to temperature, then uh, this variable are correlated even if uh, the distance in them is far. Uh, so and so um, so, the, so for for high um, 
for large values of j compared to temperature, you have this uh, strong correlation between this uh, spins of long distances. And if this, you break the symmetry just a tiny bit by boundary conditions, then the average the, uh, or the uh, Gibbs distribution gives a non-zero value for this monetization, well, for the variable at some site. And that, that is true even if you take the, this breaking by boundary condition to be to zero. It's still remains on zero. On the other hand, for small j, correlations decay exponentially uh, over the distance. And the thermal average of this quantity vanishes regardless of the boundary conditions. So for uh, large j, uh, uh, you know, the energy is minimal and the thermal fluctuations don't do, don't do much. But for small j, a temperature uh, well, is uh, so high that uh, thermal fluctuations destroy the order between the spins. Now, it's not true that uh, all kinds of phase transitions are associated with symmetry breaking. Actually, if you go back to this water, uh, well, this water phase diagram, well, there was, well, this line is associated with the breaking of symmetry, but this line isn't. So, um, and actually, um, uh, there's no sim change of symmetry as you go across this line. And in fact, you can continue from water vapor to water going around like this. Thing. So that's one, another way to say that. It's really the same phase. Uh, or you could say maybe, okay, near, near this line there's a distinction, but it's a local distinction. Globally, there's no distinction between water and water vapor. So you can go around this transition. On the other hand, the distinction between ice and water is uh, completely absolute because one has translation symmetry, the other one doesn't. It has less translation symmetry. So, um, so that's a standard um, um, picture. By the way, so we can ask you, what, what, where did this phase transition come from? It's not from symmetry breaking. Well, it's a dynamical issue. So it comes from the fact that uh, water molecules, they uh, repel at short, distance, at short distances, but uh, attract at long distances. And one can show that if you, if you somehow manage to switch off the attractions long distances, actually you wouldn't have this, this transition line at all. You just have like one phase, which could hold uh, liquid or gas, but just one phase. So because of the attraction, uh, this line appears. Now, um, so this phase transition we discussed so far um, were driven by uh, thermal fluctuations. So uh, for large temperature, uh, disorder winds, and there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking, so there's only short range order. But for small temperature, there's long range order. Um, however, it became clear more recently that there can also be phase transitions at zero temperature. And those are driven by quantum fluctuations. And the interesting thing is that it's entirely different from, um, uh, well, the physics is very, very different from physics of uh, standard or, or familiar thermal phase transitions. Now, uh, well, temperature is stuck at zero, but we're still allowed to vary parameters of the, of the Hamiltonian. And uh, so phase transition here appears in the phase diagram where the, you don't have any temperature, just the parameters of the Hamiltonian. So here is a, uh, again, everybody's favorite example of a system exhibiting a quantum phase transition. So called the uh, uh, quantum Ising chain. But uh, there's a nice book on quantum phase transition by such that, super such that. Uh, So uh, we have there, it's a prime example. So what's the system here? Well, <coughs> here instead of classical spins, you have uh, quantum spins. They're called qubits, uh, but it's really just uh, uh, some. Uh, well, a qubit is simply a system with two-dimensional Hilbert space. So it's going to half, in other words. And at each side, we have a one-dimensional system. So we have a chain of these qubits located at integer points, points with integer coordinates. And uh, on each side, you have observables, which you know like this, x, y, and z with hats, because the operators. Uh, now, they satisfy the usual relation of Pauli matrices. Like there's accumulation relations. Um, and uh, also, they all square to 1, all these things as y to the z, and also for different values of the index a, they all commute. So, the, you know, the observables, uh, think about it algebraically, so you have algebra observables, and on each side, there's the algebra of power matrices, but uh, if you look at the whole thing, it will change, just that kind of infinite tensor problem. But I should emphasize that uh, when I talk about phase transition, I should really think about infinite systems. 
take the thermodynamic limit. And if, in a final polynomial, there's no specific phase transition. Now, of course, uh, in real life, nothing is infinite, but uh, so all phase transitions are really only approximate, but uh, for all practical purposes, you can imagine that uh, the system is infinite. So then mathematically, it becomes, it's easy to treat the system with this expectation. Well, not easier, but it's more natural uh, if it's uh, infinite from the start. So you can imagine that this index A here runs over all integers. And the total Hilbert space is roughly the product of on-site Hilbert spaces. Now, this, by the way, is a subtle statement. So, uh, John von Neumann uh, famously wrote a paper on infinite uh, products. And the products explain actually that it doesn't make any sense, take infinite times the product. So, uh, so, you should keep in mind that mathematically that's not what we're supposed to do. Uh, but rather, one should take the tensor product of uh, the uh, algebras or observables over all sides, not all the Hilbert spaces. But for the purpose of this talk, and so on, keep keeping the elementary among the uh, work. Uh, well, yeah, just say it's a product of Hilbert spaces. Again, here's a Hamiltonian. It's also an operator I forgot to put a hat. And the first term is just like uh, the Ising model of Hamiltonian, or well, energy function. If you just meant, if you recall that z is squared to 1, then Essentially, each z can take as a 1 or minus 1. So, so this is just like, just like variable sigma in the previous. Uh, uh, well, before I wrote a two dimensional case, it's like one dimensional Ising model. Okay. There's also a second term, though, which does not come into the first one uh, because it's made of x's rather than z. And this you can think of as a magnetic field term. So, in that sort of, imagine so this spins up like to align in the z direction, but the magnetic field is in the x direction. Sometimes people call this transverse magnetic field. So, um, so okay, so what, what's the phase structure of the system? Well, here there are two parameters. The temperature is zero, so H and J. And we know the ratio of this H and J matters. So, um, suppose we fix this J. Uh, and let's take it positive for simplicity. It's positive, it means that, um, well, the first term wants the spin, the Z, projections of spin to be uh, the same for all A, because then the energy is minimal. <laughs> so if positive J, the system, this term, if it was the only term, would make the system a quantum ferromagnet. So there's all Zs are either plus one or minus one. Now, of course, the second term kind of interferes with it. But if you imagine that, first of all, if you have small H, then you just neglect this term, and then all your Zs are either a binary one or all of them minus one. So the system is a quantum ferromagnet. Well, on the other hand, if your H is large compared to J, then uh, this term uh, is dominant. So you can just forget about even have the second of this first term and just diagonalize it this last term. And the diagonalization is very simple. We just uh, say, well, all your spins must be eigenstates of this X poly matrix. So or the minimal possible eigenvalue. So if it's H is positive, then you want the eigenvalue of X to be minus 1 for each of Well, the point is that, um, well, in the, in, so the simultaneous has a symmetry which flips the sign of all Z's, but does not flip X. Well, if you ask what is, how to implement the symmetry, well, <coughs> you just conjugate everything with an infinite product of all X's, right? If you conjugate uh, X with X, you get, you know, you, you get uh, back to X. If you conjugate the z with x, then it flips sign. So your symmetry is simply you know, infinite product of all x's. So this symmetry is there for any values of the parameter in the sense that it's similar to Hamiltonian. Conjugating Hamiltonian with this infinite product of x's leaves Hamiltonian invariant. But uh, for small j, the two ground states actually are not invariant of the symmetry. They are rather flipped by the symmetry. And then for large h, uh, the ground state does not break symmetry. It's a single ground state, which can hold quantum parameters. So, um, well, this example of a quantum phase transition, which refers to some value of the Hamilton of H, to change from small to large, was kind of boring because um, quantum paramagnet and quantum paramagnet are different in the same way that the order disordered phases of the two dimensional Ising model are different. So it seems different because it's a quantum system at zero temperature, but actually it's the same example, just written in the final language. Uh, so you can actually map one to the other. 
So um, it's just that um, well, classical 1D Ising model doesn't have a phase transition at, zero temp at, at positive temperature, but you know, quantum Ising model has a phase transition at zero temperature. Well, the de Ising model has a phase transition at positive temperature. So, uh, they're, physically, they're distinct, but mathematically, they really can be mapped one to another. Now, so this example is uh, boring, but does mean that there are a lot of examples of quantum transitions that are equally boring. In fact, there are lots of uh, other quantum phases of matter and phase functions between them, and most of them have nothing to do with uh, spontaneous symmetry. Really. So, uh, whatever Landau said in 1937 actually doesn't apply to them. Uh, and uh, rather, the current viewpoint is that you should forget about. Uh, the issue of symmetry breaking, uh, rather to distinguish uh, phases at zero temperature by the just simply looking, staring at the ground state wave function and looking at how entangled it is. Now this viewpoint uh, is, is uh, inspired by quantum information uh, and is advocated in this uh, not well, book which came out not too long ago by Shagan Wen and collaborators. Um, so I refer to that book for legal discussion, I must say that this, this idea is still not completely, it's not completely clear to what extent it's true, but um, certainly it does provide a new perspective on one of the phases of matter. And by the way, I should forget to say that, um, well, this is um, this a rather revolutionary idea because um, when we talk about um, um, phase transitions, typically you start by specifying your Hamiltonian or energy function, but here you are instead just fall through to the ground state wave function. And uh, you're not so, you don't need to know what the Hamiltonian is. You, well, maybe somebody tells you that there is a, a Hamiltonian, but uh, you don't need to know the Hamiltonian to figure out which phase you're in. Well, so you just work with the ground state wave function. That's another tricky uh, as a result because so without is you're supposed to construct some invariance or some sort of signatures on all uh, different phases simply by looking at the wave function. And all wave functions seem to be the same. Well, it's not quite true. So then we not only talk about entanglement. And so what it means to have a pattern of entanglement. Well, um, well the simplest example of entanglement occurs in a system just made of two pieces. Like the systems A and B. They're called bipartite systems in quantum information theory. So the Hilbert space is a tensor product uh, of two Hilbert spaces. Now, uh, what it means is that any state vector can be written as a linear combination of products or basis vectors for H, A, and B. The coefficients is complex numbers. Now, of course, yeah, you want to, uh, you, know, you want, I'm assuming here, well, Usually, I assume that these base vectors are uh, normalized, so the norm is 1. So, if you want this side to be normalized, and this sum of square with number c, it also be, it's also be 1. So, we have this, uh, so that, that, this kind of states are what's called pure states. Right? So, they're pure states of this composite system. Well, then, everybody's going to favorite example is the case of uh, just when two qubits. So, you take uh, one. You take both uh, HA and HB to be two dimensions. Then basis vectors, there are just two of them for each of them, you know, like this. Uh, uh, spin up and spin down. Now, uh, well, when you have this bipartite system, you can look at states of, uh, which do have very, uh, which are very classical, like for example this one. Uh, here, let's say A has spin up, B has also spin up, or A has spin up and B has spin up. So this space is just, they're not sounds of tensor product, they're just simply the product of two basis vectors. So that states are uh, called factorized. But also there are some weird states like this, which are linear combinations uh, of products, not simply products. And such states um, don't really have a good classical counterpart. Uh, so they're called entangled states. And the weird thing about this such state is that even though, well, if somebody tells you, okay, here's my state of a system, 
that's only a description of the state, it's a wave function. So you know everything about the composite system. Because what happens if I measure spin of, uh, let's say, subsystem A or subsystem B? The answer is we have no idea. So some people know everything about the composite, but they know nothing about each part. So uh, that's what the component entanglement means. So let's say it's called entangled. Well, more generally, if you ask what's entangled state, well, first of all, uh, in general, you, you're supposed to describe a quantum system not by a, a st state vector, by a density matrix. So positive self adjoint operator on the Hilbert space with unit trace. And then if you ask, well, how do you use it, how do you use it to compute, say, expectation value of some observable, well, there's a version of the Born rule for that, which just says, well, take the trace of product, the density matrix, and uh, you observe it. So a wave function is a special case of this, because uh, you have a wave function, you can attach to it a, a density matrix, so the projector to this the wave vector. But of course, not every density matrix is a projector. There's no reason to do a projector in general. No, it's not a projector, it's, it's a, one says that the state is a, a mixed state. So what I said before, more precisely probably as follows. So suppose you have this bipartite system with bipartite system with this uh, particular wave function. It's a pure state because it's a wave function. It's a good density matrix of the project. But now you ask, what is the uh, density matrix just for a subsystem P? The density matrix is very simple. It just, uh, well, it just a density matrix that's perfection. One happens simply because the trace would be one. And the space is two dimensional. So, um, okay, so the situation when your density matrix is just proportional to identity, precisely sort of zero, when you have zero information about what the system is doing. So, so just, you know, what's in before, here the, the, the composite state is completely known, nevertheless we have zero information about the subsystem. Uh, in general, uh, what is an entangled state? Well, in general you say, well, there's some state or composite, and if it doesn't, it's not a tensor product, it, it, density matrix is not a tensor product of density matrix of subsystems, you say the state is entangled. But this entangled states bothered some people, uh, especially Einstein, very much. Uh, so there's a famous paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935. They said, well, these states are so weird that uh, probably quantum mechanics cannot be the fundamental theory of nature. Because it, what kind of stuff is available? How can it be that you have some information about the system but doesn't make any predictions about subsystem? It just makes no sense. Well, Einstein was wrong there uh, because uh, quantum entanglement certainly exists and in fact, Einstein has it demonstrated experimentally in the last year it was the Nobel Prize for the confirming the existence of entangled states. But of course, even, even before, uh, long before this Nobel Prize, we know that quantum mechanics works, so uh, to great accuracy, so we know that uh, uh, entangled states that are real. So, um, so instead of like uh, fighting entanglement, we should put it to good use. And uh, uh, this theory of topological phases of matter puts it to good use by uh, uh, figuring out, well, by determining what sort of different patterns, what are the different patterns of entanglement there are. So, so let's look again at this example of the quantumizing chain and see what sort of, entang what, what sort of entanglement do we, we have here in the ground state. So this philosophy uh, that uh, Shao Gao Wen advocated is just forget about the phenomenon, just look at the ground state. This is something interesting. Okay, so we have two parameters, magnetic field and the coupling. The magnetic field is very large. Well, first of all, the ground state actually could cover other tricky to write down in general. But if I take the uh, magnetic field to be like infinite, then it becomes very simple. You just diagonalize the Hamiltonian, uh, and then the, the, your very unique ground state looks like this. So just all spins are in the x direction. So that's what we call the unentangled state, or factorized state. Well, it's an infinite product rather than finite, but still factorized state. Not entangled. Now, that, in the opposite limit, when magnetic field is small, again, if, if, if it's just small, I cannot really write down very 
easily the ground state wave function, but I can if it's literally zero. Then there are two general ground states. One has all spins up, and the other one has all spins down. Both are, again, unentangled. So, well, the phase transition happens between somehow this state and this or this. Well, we don't see any difference then. So here, uh, you go from unentangled state to unentangled state. Well, and that's because uh, this phase transition is kind of boring one. It's uh, related to sort of break. Also, another thing which kind of bothers some about this um, is that, um, well, if you're not strictly at infinite or zero magnetic field, then the ground state is entangled. It's pretty complicated, actually. So, um, so what do we well, so on, on, on one hand, it's entangled. On the other hand, you would say that, well, infinite or small magnetic field is basically the same for the data. So even though uh, they're not, uh, one state is entangled, the other one isn't, they're sort of the same pattern of entanglement for the data. And similarly for infinite and just very large age, you know, you have a, uh, nothing dramatic ha changes that happens if you change age from infinity to just being very large, but the, the ground state does become entangled somewhat. Now, um, what needs to be done to make precise the statement that the wave functions are entangled is, is to sort of loosen the definition of what means to be entangled. It needs some sort of an equivalence relation on different wave functions which allow you to compare and say, well, these two ground state wave functions, well, they don't look the same, but still the same equivalence class. They're still, I say, boring entanglement pattern. And, well, this is where quantum information helps, or some ideas at least from quantum information. So this, some, this picture doesn't mean anything. I guess, you know, the two spins somehow entangled. That's what this question is. I just got it from the internet. So, okay, so what is the... Uh, um, we use a very little uh, quantum information here. First of all, it's uh, called quantum gates. Or, so for, for the logic gates, right, or normal, are just uh, devices which take several bits as an input and produce one or more bits as outputs. So these are common <coughs> engineering, and those are irreversible in general. For example, you have an AND gate, you know, just take, take two bits and get one bit out. That doesn't really uh, happen in quantum information theory there, uh, you only, uh, you, you assume from the beginning that uh, you have reversible transformations. So if you start with two, two bits for the qubits, you end up with two qubits. Or if you start with n qubits, you end up with n qubits. So quantum gate thus is a, some transformation from a state of n qubits uh, to, again, to a final state of also n qubits uh, with some unity transformation. Now some people, well, Qubits is a system with two, two states, two-dimensional Hilbert space. Protocols about qubits. Qubits is just a system with you know, D states, so it's qubits. But in well, anyway, information, people usually just think about qubits. And qubits are regarded as something, uh, some exotic stuff. So for example, uh, uh, say not gate, or a quantum not gate is simply uh, a transformation which acts on two-dimensional Hilbert space, and this is the matrix. Has one qubit in, one qubit in, one qubit out. So it's a unitary map from Hilbert space, from two-dimensional space to itself. But then controlled not, it acts on a four-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, why four-dimensional? Well, there are two qubits which come in, you know, the, uh, the control bit and then the information bit of qubit. So two, two come out as well. So in, in the usual, it's a controlled not, you know. You, you have control bit, and, and you have uh, information bit, and you know, you only, on the output you only have a single bit. But in quantum information, you know those bits. You know, you know those two are in them to come up. And in general, there's some other interesting uh, unitaries which don't have classical counterpart. So um, in general, well, you can of course get more complicated gates if we're composing some simple gates. Uh, and uh, here's an example. You can imagine, say, some chain of uh, qubits, which I denote by this blue line. Like, say, each of these little blue things is a qubit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven qubits come in. And then, well, seven should also come out. So there's seven right here. 
Uh, and we construct some complicated gate for the seven qubits simply by composing simpler gates on just a few, few qubits, say. So in this picture, for example, you only see uh, gates with like one-to-one -one gates and two-to-two -two gates, nothing else. So, uh, and there are no layers. Here's the first layer. So like, uh, in each layer, your gates act only on the, say, so this gate only acts on these two qubits. The next one acts on these two, they don't talk to each other. Uh, and the last one just acts on a single qubit. So then the second layer, which again acts only on uh, gates, acts on, only on one or two qubits, and again they don't talk to each other. And there's also a third layer. So such compositions, well, different gates are called uh, uh, quantum circuits. Now, uh, the interesting thing about quantum circuits is that, well, first of all, well, we, we can, can entangle different, well, say, so this gate, suppose the original state is just some <coughs> untangled state, say 0, 1, 1, 0. You apply the, you know, the first gate and entangles, say, these two bits. So the, the output already has, well, the factorized state is going to be now not an ent entangled state. So if, even if the original was always unentangled, the output is entangled state. Okay. And then you get further entanglement from other layers of the quantum circuit. But if you have only a finite number of layers, then for example, this qubit gets entangled only with uh, this, uh, so only with this, a few neighboring qubits, say up to here. Right? This qubit is not entangled with this qubit. So the, the sort of, when you apply like uh, this form of circuit, well, it's sort of a uh, neighbor, neighboring qubits get entangled, but qubits which are far apart are not entangled. Well, how far you need to go to get to, again, to unentangled qubits? Well, it depends on how many layers you have. Okay, like this picture kind of shows this sort of a light pole or entanglement. It's created by each one of the circuits. So, uh, of course, if you allow your gates to be like, like here I only have a picture with only, you know, gates which entangle a pair of qubits. So, if you allow like some gates which go all the way across the system, like, like this, then everything is entangled in one step. So I imagine the situation where you have like either infinite number of qubits, or maybe a large or finite one, and then the gates allow, they all have like a small range, like one, two, three, but that's it. Or if, in other words, the range of qubits is fixed and, and small compared to the system size. Then, uh, if I have a few layers, then I get entangled only, entangled only in neighboring qubits. But such state is, is called short range entangled. So if you start with a factorized state and apply some quantum circuit, you get something which is entangled, but not very much. So only neighboring qubits get entangled. It's called a short range entangled state. Okay, finally I can give a definition of what it means to be, uh, to have a, uh, to get, to have a, uh, two equivalent patterns of entanglement as far as quantum information is concerned. So two states of qubits are equivalent if they're related by this, by quantum circuit. And finite depth, I mean like, well, just a finite number of layers. The depth of quantum circuit is number of layers. Uh, so you have, say, infinite, it makes it precise, I must say that, uh, I must really consider like some infinite system of qubits and say, well, if two patterns of entanglement of an infinite system of qubits, a good if you can get one from the other by the finite depth quantum circuit. Or if you prefer to work with a finite number of qubits, then, uh, then you should make sure that your uh, depth for the circuit is small compared to the... Uh, well, if, if you allow depth to be as large as the size of the system, then all the wave functions become you know, related in this way, so you don't get interesting classification. But if your depth is small compared to the size of the system, then you get interesting decomposition of states because of the circuit different patterns of entanglement, different classes. So for example, a short range entangled state is entangled, but is equivalent to an unentangled state. Let's say it's a trivial pattern of entanglement. <coughs> now from the quantum information point of view, that's what you do. But from the point of view of finance matter, that's not quite the right definition, even though it's in the right direction. For example, if you look at this quantum Isaac chain, 
and ask, okay, look at the ground state for different values, of, even neighboring values of parameters. Do they have the same pattern of entanglement from this point, or in this sense? Well, not really. <coughs> for example, you can start with, say, case, like, of intermagnetic field. So, quantum paramagnet, a intermagnetic field, has an un really unentangled ground state. But now let's uh, change when they feel something smaller, not infinite, but something larger. Well, the wave function becomes entangled. Uh, is it short range entangled at least? Well, the answer is no. Uh, because, uh, okay, qubits which are far apart are almost not entangled, but they're still entangled a little bit. So the entanglement just drops as a function of distance, but it doesn't go to zero beyond some finite range. So that's not uh, quite the right uh, one, uh, definition. Because we want to say that, well, if I generate a field, unless you cross space transition, I don't change pattern of entanglement. Uh, so, well, but if one can fix this as follows. Uh, uh, so each unitary in this quantum circuit is really like a discretization of some time evolution. So it's approximately equal to some time order exponential uh, or, uh, or Hamiltonian. Time dependent Hamiltonian or some sort. Well, where in each, so each uh, u is just uh, like uh, approximately given by this uh, evolution of a small unitary. So that's because modern information people like these discrete things, but uh, a kind of standard person likes uh, continuous things. So we might as well just uh, say, well, the correct thing to look at is this thing. Not the product, just approximation to this. Just an approximation to this. And what is this? Well, this is just evolution. Uh, of a ground state wave function by some time, de time dependent Hamiltonian. And what's a Hamiltonian? Well, it's absolutely any Hamiltonian. Any local Hamiltonian. It has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian. Well, when I find the ground state wave function, I solve some problem, I solve some Schrodinger equation with some Hamiltonian. It's a different Hamiltonian. That one has physical meaning. This one is absolutely anything. So, um, so uh, let's call such a unitary, which is uh, evolution operator with any local finite range Hamiltonian, it's called such a thing a fuzzy quantum circuit. Fuzzy because, uh, well, the quantum circuit leaves far away qubits unentangled, but the fuzzy one turns out, uh, uh, makes, uh, creates some entanglement between far away qubits, but it's very small and they're pretty far away. But it's highly non trivial statement. Uh, well, it's not obvious, that's true. It's something called Lee Robinson bound. Uh, which is a mathematical expression of this property of a uh, finite time evolution by what local. This, prop this uh, theorem was proved in the, in the 60s, I think, but only recently people realized what it actually means. What it means is that entanglement um, is very suppressed if you apply this fuzzy one sort of distances. So, so I'm just repeating what I said. When a fuzzy one sort is applied to an unentangled state, the entanglement of faraway qubits is not zero, but it's very small. It should be get exponential. And finally, we can give it the right definition of quantum phase. So quantum phase, well, two states are in the same quantum phase, or have the same pattern of entanglement, if they're related by a fuzzy quantum circuit of any kind. That is, by evolution with local Hamilton. In particular, a trivial phase or trivial pattern of entanglement is the one you can get uh, uh, from unentangled state by applying this fuzzy quantum circuit. Again, I'm simplifying a little bit. The actual definition actually is a little bit more complicated. Good enough for our purposes here. Okay, so um, now here is a well question. Let's just try to write down some non-trivial ground state wave function with non-trivial pattern of entanglement. Uh, first of all, quantum ionizing chain is not going to be uh, useful here because actually they, they only get trivial pattern of entanglement. Well, it turns out that if you like, really use this definition, like you said, there aren't any interesting examples. There's a theorem which says that <coughs> if all excitations are get, that is, all excitations have energy, which is at least some number delta, the same for all excitations, then the ground state wave function always has a trivial entanglement factor. They're just some statement that in one dimension, this definition doesn't give you anything interesting. So, um, what I would say is that you know, if you look at states with an energy gap, that is, what all equations are gap, then there's only one phase really, the trivial one. 
Now, in higher dimensions, that's not true. It's a very, very special fact about one dimensional systems. But um, I don't want to go to, uh, yet to higher dimensions. I want to give a simple example, so we'll do it. Uh, well, for example, just, just because of this statement, we can get the quantum Isaac chain in a trivial phase. So that was a, was a boring example. But to get something interesting, let's impose some symmetry. Turns out that, that, that this theorem ceases to be correct with this one. Ceases to be correct if uh, uh, you impose symmetry. So suppose you have some symmetry action on individual qubits for uh, plane transformation, some symmetry group there, which you call G. And let's only look at wave functions which invary on this symmetry. Uh, then it's natural also to restrict quantum, well, if I want to only work with invariant uh, wave functions, symmetric wave functions, <coughs> I to restrict my quantum gates and my quantum circuits. For example, we should just restrict the circuits which uh, are made of G-invariant quantum gates, that is, gates which come into a symmetric transformation. Similarly, if I look at fuzzy quantum circuits, I should really probably restrict to those simultaneous is G-invariant. So this way, I never destroy symmetry when I apply a fuzzy quantum circuit. And once we accept this, we can define a sort of uh, a phase with a symmetry, quantum phase with a symmetry, by saying, well, two G-invariant wave functions in the same phase if they're related by a G-invariant fuzzy quantum circuit. Um, so, um, so with symmetry, actually, you can get interesting patterns of entanglement. So this idea that if you combine entanglement with a symmetry, and symmetry gets something non-trivial, well, it basically means that you have some uh, patterns of entanglement which are non-trivial, and when, uh, uh, provided they're protected by symmetry, if you impose symmetry. So hence, they call symmetry protected patterns of entanglement. And here's the simplest example of such a thing. Suppose you have a, uh, on each side uh, a copy of uh, uh, C4, this <coughs> polymeric You think of it as a pair of qubits, uh, because uh, they're just each of them is C2. So each side you can think of it as just a pair of qubits. So here's a picture. So each dot, each each circle, each blue circle is in the cube. And the side is this like a you know, little, I guess, big snout of the side. So that's just a system. What about the state of a system? Well, um, let's look at some entangled state of two qubits. And I like this one. Um, and let's not like this. It's a state of two qubits, which is entangled. Now, what do we do with it? Well, first we can just say, well, in each, uh, on each side, I just look at create this state. Well, then, of course, the, the whole thing is just tensor product of this state, and this one, and this one. And this one. That's a trivial pattern of entanglement. But let's do something different. Let's entangle not uh, qubits inside each side, but qubits in neighboring sides, like this. <coughs> so this uh, state was uh, considered first by Affleck, Kennedy, Lee, and Tasaki in 1987. Well, they didn't think about entanglement, but they didn't consider this state. And they explained that this state responds to a non trivial quantum phase, or in their sense, for entanglement. But actually, um, well, what, what can I say now? Well, first of all, um, if you ignore symmetry, then this is a trivial phase. Uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that you can disentangle this state by uh, uh, a quantum circuit. You don't even need to go this fuzzy thing to just apply a quantum circuit. You disentangle the state. How? Well, well we just uh, you can just uh, apply a quantum circuit which they act on this guy, you know, this guy, the two layer of quantum circuit will disentangle the system completely. It just needs two layers. Turns out, though, that if you impose a rotation group in three dimensional space, well, why in three dimensional space? Well, we have two people, well, a qubit with a spin, right? So we can think of an actual rotation group on this. On this spin. So we have two spins, well, you have two spin halves, and the, the, the result decomposes as a well, it's still a representation of SO3. So, so each side um, uh, has an action of SO3. And actually, this state, this AKLT state, has SO3 symmetry. It's, it's not it's invariant under arbitrary SO3 transformations. 
turns out that we cannot disentangle this state by any SO3 invariant quantum circuit, or even SO3 invariant quasi quantum circuit. That's what it means that state is a, has a material pattern of entanglement. How do we see that? Well, it's not particularly easy, but one hint that something interesting is going on is by looking at the finite segment of the KLT chain. You see, these uh, qubits are entangled, but the, the two qubits at the end are not. So uh, at the end of a chain, you have uh, two qubits, one here, one there, uh, which transform a spin representation of SO3. Uh, and this is despite the fact that each side transforms an integral spin representation. This funny situation uh, can be described as follows. So imagine the, our 1D system is sort of a universe. And made of atoms with, with integral SO3 spin. So we never have any half integral SO3 spin. Now, if we like, imagine living this 1D universe and, and then suddenly discover we have fourfold degeneracy of the ground state, and it comes from uh, zero, uh, so zero energy excitation living at the two ends of this universe. Now, there, uh, and moreover, we discover that these four uh, states transform as uh, a triplet and the single uh, and the SO3. Now, these two citations will be very hard from each other, because two ends of the universe. So how do they transform under SO3, like each of them separately? Well, the, the two of them together transform as 3 plus 1, but uh, um, since 4 is 2 times 2, each edge must be uh, in, in, a, in a half of the universe. So uh, our atoms are only half integral spin, but nevertheless, the edge on the ed edges of the universe there are half integral spins. And then sometimes spin goes fractional. So this fractional relation of the spin is uh, similar to fractional charge and fractional quantum hole effect. And that's what the, how we know that this, uh, roughly speaking, that this pattern of entanglement is not true because of the edges you have this funny fractional spins. So there's a similar trick uh, which I invented by Kitaev, uh, which works with fermions. It's even more impressive, uh, even though the idea is the same. So let's start with fermionic qubits. So fermionic qubit has two states, just like usual qubit. The difference, though, is that the one state is a uh, bosons, and the other one is a fermion. So this is a say, bosonic state, and one is fermionic state. Uh, so and then A is the A dagger is a fermionic creation of fermions to satisfy this relation. So for each, uh, there's a way to rewrite the fermionic qubit in a different way. We introduce these linear combinations. There's a Hermitian operator. It satisfies this very simple algebra. Each squares to one, and then to meet. So that uh, is called the uh, Majorana fermion. So you can think of a fermionic qubit instead as a Majorana fermion, two, as a pair of Majorana fermions. So because it can work in the basis A A dagger or this Diawan gamut. So let's know the single minor fermion by a single dot. Uh, then a, a ground state, say zero, is basically an entangled set of two minor fermions. So we can know it like this. The same symbol but different interpretation. So a ground state is a entangled set of two minor fermions. Uh, well, an unentangled state, just a bunch of ground states, will be like, like this. But what we, if we entangle Majoranas from different sides, like this? So that, that, that gives a state known as uh, Kitaev chain state. And that chain has a non-trivial pattern of entanglement. Now with fermions. But this is a kind of remarkable effect because uh, um, we have this Majorana uh, zero mode at the ends, even though uh, uh, this whole system is made only of qubits, Fermionic qubits. So I think it was is a one half of a fermion, zero fermions, but so we managed to create one half fermions out of normal fermions. Now in a, um, one I think of a Majorana fermion is a fermion which is its own antiparticle. Um, so as far as I know, there are no elementary Majorana fermions, but somehow one can make uh, non-elementary Majorana fermions by fractionalizing usual fermions. So. Um, and that, that is a signature of non-trivial entanglement patterns. And people actually have been trying for the last 10 years or more to create such a uh, system in the lab and actually find better performance. I don't think we've all been achieved it. Okay. 
So, um, okay, so that's what I want to say about one dimensional systems, but uh, we should maybe try something in two dimensions. So, here's a, 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 a one closer to experiment. So, well, this is a pretty like, academic system which can be realized in the lab. But there's one interesting system which can be realized in the lab, which is a part of a variety of systems of this class called the fraction bone hole states. So, um, so what, I remind you that uh, uh, you have a system of electron with very low temperature and a random potential uh, in a strong magnetic field, then the, uh, famously its uh, hole conductance is quantized. That is, it's some p squared over h, where h is Planck constant, e is electric charge, times some number, which is some rational number. So when it's integer, it's called integer quantum hole effect. When it's uh, rational, it's called fractional quantum hole effect. But anyway, this quantization like that. By the way, the system is an insulator because the usual longitudinal conductivity is zero. Well, it's strictly zero temperature. Now, this system has this system has edge modes which carry electric current even in equilibrium. This is really strange because usually when current flows, you need voltage drop to, to, to push the current flow. But here, there's a current kind of flowing around the edge of the system without any without any voltage. Drop. So the fact that there is funny edge mode suggests that perhaps there's a trivial pattern of entanglement in this system. Um, and it, it actually, it's actually true. Um, uh, if you keep in mind you want symmetry. Um, you want symmetry just to have relate to relative charge. But, um, so the system does have a trivial pattern of entanglement, um, even for the case of uh, integer polyphony. But how do we see that? So what exactly, how do we detect this property? Well, let me try to explain how it's done. So, so let's look at this two-dimensional system and let's put it into left and right half planes as well as up and down half planes. So left and right, left and right half plane, and up and down, or top and bottom, or another way to decompose it. Now, um, suppose, well, this can decompose a charge also into left and right half pieces, and also up and down. And suppose you have this ground state wave function of an two dimensional system. But how do we extract some, how do we figure out whether it has a trivial or non trivial pattern of entanglement? Well, there's one thing you can do as follows. First, assuming that your state uh, is a ground state of Hamiltonian and all state is a gap. Namely, if you hit your ground state wave function with the right charge, uh, well, the charge in the right half plane. But well, you don't get zero, but you get something. You can replace this right charge by just something, which is just leaves on the a line separating left and right half. So why is that? Well, if you act with the charge everywhere, you just annihilate the state and get zero. If you write, but if you write, if you act with the charge which only acts on the right half plane, well, points far away from this um, uh, line don't even know that you didn't act with the whole charge. So whatever you get is on zero only when uh, only close to the this line separating left and right half planes. So there should be some operator, which you call k left right, which lies on just on the line. It's not defined uniquely, but when it should be some some guy like that. Similarly, if you hit your ground state with the down part of the charge, the result can be also obtained by acting with some um, uh, operator also on the horizontal line in this plane. And then you can ask, okay, what would else? What do we do with this thing? Well, just take the commutator and then take the average. Uh, remarkably, it turns out that this number is proportional to the whole conductance, but it's obtained from totally different procedures. So, so it's a, like if you take this, and one can show that if you take this non trivial pattern of entanglement, you will get zero. So when you get something non zero, it can only happen because your, your ground state has non trivial pattern of entanglement. One of all states has not have a zero value for it. Okay, so um, I didn't have the time to um, to well to uh, explain. Well, the, all these examples were had to do with symmetry in some way. There is a way to write down pattern of entanglement which is not doesn't have any symmetry, but starting in two dimensions. But I won't I won't show it here. Let me just summarize. Uh, first of all, different. The like quantum phases can be distinguished by the patterns of entanglement of the ground state wave function. And you don't need to know the Hamiltonian. Uh, 
so that it exists. Uh, now, uh, it's kind of tricky though to extract the same this information from the just the graphic wave function. Well, one can show, for example, in one dimensions, there are actually any patterns of rectangular which are not trivial. It's what it, one, one gets something interesting if we impose this symmetry. Well, for d greater than one, there are also non trivial patterns of entanglement without any symmetry, but I will show you uh, how they're constructed. Um, and uh, th this fact is a starting point, actually, for topological quantum computation, a scheme for building a general quantum computer. So um, the, the key word here is, well, is that, that uh, precisely the key, key point precisely the two starting dimension two, you have this uh, states which have no trivial pattern entanglement even without any symmetry. And the excitations are weird properties as well allowed you to theoretically build a pathological form of computer. So thank you so much for this nice and very deep intriguing intriguing talk. Now we can take several questions. Yes? Questions, please. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, just want to ask one question about your last equation. I'm just wondering, because it's so, it's a beautiful equation, so I'm just like wondering if you can immediately generalize this to 3D topological insulators where you generate the charge at the surfaces and look at the commutators uh, and so on, or would that, would you see? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you must have thought of that actually. Yeah, well, so this, um, the volume insulators, of which of the non-interacting time uh, can, of course, uh, be described in a similar way. And there, it's not the right formulas for various indices, in regards to dimensional symmetry class. Now, this formula that I wrote is uh, uh, developed so to describe uh, systems of arbitrary strong interactions. And uh, if you uh, ask, uh, well, are there some two-dimensional uh, invariants like that? Well, you need, first of all, to impose symmetry, uh, translational symmetry, otherwise you won't have any two dimensions. You have a better. You have to have translational symmetry as well as you want symmetry. Because this system, this applies in the system of disorder, this kind of formula that I wrote down here. But in three dimensions, to get anything on trivial, you need to impose translational symmetry. Uh, that's one thing. Um, and uh, uh, there is a way to do that, but it's an interacting case. Which is rather not trivial, um, and but it's um, it's basically related to properties of, of vortices. Um, it, uh, you can also interpret this number as saying something about the charge of a vortex. Right, exactly. But it, it, there's a similar thing uh, in uh, three dimensions. But that would be the effect related. To well, it depends on precisely which symmetry class you're talking about. Like in the simplest case of turn you know, three dimensional turn insulators. Basically, you get charge per. You can imagine the you know, flux tube, the charge per unit length of this flux tube with your with the quantity. You can describe it, you can give the dimension along the same lines. But for more complicated symmetry classes, uh, it's much trickier because the variants, in general, the variants are not numbers, but some elements of some discrete, some fine groups. So, would it also apply, for instance, to quantum spin hole effect? So there the charge would be there. Yeah, it's much trickier for quantum spin hole effect. Because whenever you have a numerical invariant, like in a turn insulator, it's easy. Yeah. But whenever you have some element like a little Z, more Z like that, yeah. then the formulas are much more complicated. Yeah. More questions, please. Thank you for this very nice interesting talk. Um, so first of all, uh, I have several questions. The first one is that uh, to make these things uh, more practical, I think currently this is limited to zero temperature, but uh, you know, topological phase transitions using some other geometric phase invariants, you can define them at higher temperatures. So uh, is it possible to bring these definitions and ideas to higher temperatures? But we still have to yeah, I don't know how to go. The thought applies only at zero temperature. Um, and typically, we'll say that all these quantum phases become really one, the same phase, as, as, you, as soon as you allow them to be one zero. Because uh, it seems to me this is this picture is very nice that uh, when you talk about patterns, uh, I, I think in terms of some graph theory, like uh, 
will have some qubits where the frequency entanglement, like uh, some edges between this uh, network. You make a simple uh, picture in the trivial entanglement with pairwise entanglement. But uh, when you go to more complex patterns, you have long range, uh, like diagonal patterns. So you go from trivial graph to more complex graphs successively. Mm -hmm. So this uh, pattern picture can be understood in terms of graph theory, maybe more sure. Well, I don't know if graph theory is useful here because the kind of well, the, the, I have to remember some examples of this kind of patterns and all. They don't have theory here, okay. so in one, uh, only one dimensional. Because we have well, committed lots to these uh, many body entangled states as using the graph theory, and uh, they have found some differences between bulk and edge uh, entanglement, and you can detect them by looking at the graphs. Uh, where he suggested this uh, total entanglement made of any kind of ideas for solid state systems. He used uh, this graph theory pictures to detect differences between bulk and boundary. In terms of it's very interesting. I don't understand it. I make some things. Uh, okay. And the last question is that uh, there is also this bionicle phase transitions uh, that uh, we are interested in. And uh, in addition to space, uh, you can look at the time. And uh, I'm not very familiar with it, but in, a, in this uh, topological material business, there are some metrics that looks like some analogies to space time metrics in high energy. So uh, are we missing something here by looking at only in space? But maybe the reason why we don't see these symmetries is the time variable is missing. It's just a philosophical uh, question, but I want to hear your idea. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. but. Uh these issues of time dependence arise against many of the positive temperatures. Mm -hmm. Then we are just for example, some American variants for this reason. Well, we have thermal hole conductance, which is a similar, very similar quantity to this hole conductance, requires to go to positive temperature. Um, and then, I guess, uh, you need to understand all of that, you know, correlated with time, which is defined. I don't know how to do that, okay, because uh, and the, the only reason one can prove such results, for example, to prove that this uh, uh, quantity, if I use it purely in terms of uh, equal time the patient uh, and it's kind of surprising it's impossible to do that, because usually transfer properties like conductance is actually given by Kubo formula, which are involved in time, time intervals. Uh, some miracles happen to into at, at zero temperature, and only this one which allows to do that. Already for thermal conductance, so we got this Kubo formula, and there's no known way to write any. Even though people believe it's actually still positive variant of temperatures, there's no known way to replace by so some better missing area. Okay. Yes, please. Um, I want to ask: Is there any difference between the classical pyramid pyramid phases? Microphone open. Push. You can press. Uh, is there any difference between the classical paramagnetic and par paramagnetic phases and the quantum uh, counterpart of these phases? Well, and the joint question, uh, uh, you said that uh, for the quantum uh, paramagnetic phases, when we take the uh, external field as uh, sufficiently small, uh, we can ignore the uh, transverse field, so uh, we can see the spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, but uh, the X operators uh, cannot to map to minus X again. If we ignore the uh, second part of the Hamiltonian, uh, can we can we take the X can go to the minus X again? Oh, okay. Uh, second question. Uh, so basically, you have a first term which aligns all your spins, and the second one tries to flip them. Uh, you can think of this as a kinetic term, which the first term is potential, the second one is kinetic. Which, uh, uh, and uh, just when it's small, oh, this kinetic sure. term is uh, negligible, so you just get frozen by the potential term. Yeah, yeah I think that uh, there shouldn't be a big difference uh, to take the uh, x to go to the minus x or x to go to x. Well, then we have uh, that particular Hamiltonian has symmetry under z goes to minus z, uh, but doesn't have symmetry under x goes to minus x. So yes, but it is ignorable. 
If if the second form is ignorable, so we can do maybe. Well, it's a, well, usually sort of if it's literally absent, then the system becomes very simple, becomes just one surprising model. Because on the hand, any system you want to turn it on. The point is simply when it's small, the trivial point is that when it's small, but not zero, the qualitative still get the same results in the classical way. As, as for the first question, yeah, it's very different. Um, well, there are different questions you can ask about um, classical and form of term magnets. So in specific, well, I recommend this book by Sajidov, which discusses a very dynamical behavior for the temperature. So dynamic behavior, which that, that question that has an interesting answer in the case of quantumizing models, there's no parallel in the case of a, a classical Turing transition. So it's totally different. So you can ask different questions for these models because uh, in a classical transition, there's already dynamic, or statistical mechanics. But here, there's also more dynamical questions because there's a Hamiltonian and the statistical mechanical issue. And they're two interacting interesting ways. So yeah. the, the model becomes quite non trivial. Uh, yeah, it has a positive answer. Yes, but uh, actually, uh, I want to ask the, uh, is there any difference between the, for example, uh, classical ferromagnetic phase and quantum ferromagnetic phase? Well, we talk about zero dimension, uh, one dimension or two dimension, because uh, these systems are really uh, interesting in one dimension, at zero temperature. And uh, certain critical exponents, exactly, well, certain questions you can ask about them, just map exactly, exactly to questions of classical transitions of two dimensions. But some other questions you can ask about these such systems have no counterpart in, uh, in classical case. These are different questions you can ask. So you can think of it as one of the subset of the other two. So there's no natural analog to some quick question after the point of view. Okay, thank you. More questions? Oh, please. Pardon? Please. Thanks. Thanks a lot. For the talk. Okay. Um, just, I have one maybe a bit uh, silly question. So uh, the index that you wrote to uh, uh, that was equal to by defining two different operators for special uh, configurations. Uh, so it, it reminded me of these out of time order correlators for uh, detecting information scrambling or quantum chaos, uh, like a special version of, of those uh, operators. Do they have any sort of relation or any, uh, maybe a similar uh, like, uh, leading way for? Uh, I don't see the similarity. Okay. Of course, um, the time uh, autops are basically um, over time, but this is kind of but the mathematical structure is quite similar, I guess. Well, I don't know. This form actually is not that mysterious if you think about what what represents physically. So basically, like acting with you can imagine this operator acting with a charge on the right side corresponds to. Uh, uh, gauge transformation uh, of this action on the side, and then back on the side of the system, and then second guy measures the charge which flows through, say, from top to bottom as you do a transformation on the right side. Yes. So, um, if you think about this precisely, this kind of version of Laplin's argument, which says that uh, the amount of charge which flows under some flux insertion is the whole conductor. So, that's basically uh, why it's really. So that's the form is actually not very serious. Well, so I, I don't see how it's related really to chaos and how form of curl is. Yeah, but yeah, okay. yeah, I'm just like this. curious about the similar thing. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? So I just want to understand. Because uh, recently IBM said that they have built this uh, 432 qubit uh, IBM quantum experience quantum computer. With IBM, they have this 432 qubit. So that they claim that they have some quantum supremacy, like 2 to the power of n, which is n is like 400. So it seems to me that when you have this one dimensional Victorian uh, chain, you spend all these n sites just to create n time between two element fermions. That how do you scale up? So if I go to more complex patterns of entanglement, uh, how can I understand the quantum supremacy and scaling advantages of these systems? Well, I mean, to, 
is one D systems not terribly useful for the So, uh, so for scaling we need still uh, well, any number of you really want to create a system where you can put my runners and like say this is two dimensions on what is the value of the chain and move them around to this. Eventually you need to do this fusion yeah. challenge. So this is not uh, well so so far people haven't seen my runners even in this form, same very simple form that they just correct. So to apply something useful, you need to do something that's quite a bit more complicated. So the whole implementation is not a practical scheme. So far, we just uh, find this hard. Okay, last questions, please. We can be one more question. Onur, please. Thank you very much for this nice uh, talk. I have two questions, actually. One is uh, related to uh, Fermion qubits for Fermion mob systems. Uh, we have no uh, transfer product. Uh, the, the state space is not uh, has not a transfer product structure. Uh, in this case, uh, how, how does that how uh, does that affect the uh, framework of quantum circuits and uh, finite depth uh, approach? Well, um, first of all, uh, yeah. So the, the states, strictly speaking, you should work with algebras, not with Hubble space, as I mentioned in the beginning. A little more mathematically correct statement. Uh, so the, we should say the algebra observables or a big chain just becomes a product. In the usual case, just becomes a product of algebra of each side. And that part does generalize because the, the harmonic case, but you just say, well, we have uh, simply harmonic algebras, which is integrated. And for those, we just take the two various kinds of product that makes perfect sense. So uh, that part actually goes through. Uh, no, no, no problem. Okay. And 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 the next question, as far as I understood, the notion of bipartite entanglement uh, is well uh, understood in this context. Uh, can we extend this to uh, multipartite entanglement? Well, I mean, if you try to describe various multipartite entanglement without any constraints at all, then it's very difficult to do so. So, um, what makes things are better if you impose a locality? In one information, which I think that I know nothing about, people consider just a bunch of qubits which entangles in a random, complicated way. So that's very difficult to describe invariants in this general setup. So what makes things uh, manageable here in a time application, because you look at the systems with locality. What it means is that you have a, not just some state of n qubits, but a state which is a ground state of some local Hamiltonian with only the affix that it makes in the manager. Uh, so, say in one dimension, we completely understand now what sort of pattern of the one can arise. You know? Even though having a number of qubits, and from the confirmation for a person, it would be you know, horrible uh, ways to entangle them. But if, if they entangle, if they all come, if they all entangle such ways to uh, make a ground state of a local Hamiltonian, actually it turns out nothing interesting can come out, they're very boring. So, yeah, so in higher dimensions, it's much more complicated. But even there, locality buys you a lot. So if you know that you know the wave function, just some random wave function for the ground state of some kind of the locality property, you get a lot of mileage out of it. So that's a problem that much people don't have. That's why you get such complicated problems, including algebra. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you once again so much for for joining us for this.